All right, so I'm going to touch base on a few things this morning. Um, here are my disclosures. I don't really have one. I had a Medtronic research grant a few years ago about human factors with Dr. Johnson and Dr. Kim, and I'll go through some of that data. So uh, navigation really has evolved over the years. Uh, started off with some of the images you see from Dr. Johnson with fluoroscopy, point surface matching, 2D, 3D. Uh, now we're into sort of the interoperative CT-based image guidance and moving towards um, robotics too. And in terms of the interoperative navigation, there are so many different variations with every company. And so uh, there's going to be uh, differences in terms of the setup and everything else. And we're not going to go through each company, but it's important to know that each um, different navigation unit has um, different capabilities. Uh, in terms of the standard use of spinal navigation, is for placement of pedicle screws. Uh, why, do, why do we use navigation for placement of pedicle screws? Because it makes us more accurate. Uh, we went from 80% to 90%. Now we're talking, you know, 97 to 99% accuracy with interoperative navigation, CT-based, and um, the um, perception of spinal navigation. This is something Dr. Johnson talked about and Dr. Kim talked about. Is that it's difficult to use. It lengthens the operating time. There's interoperative glitches, and there's a steep learning curve. Uh, so let's talk a little about the learning curve. And before that, there was a, there was a survey, and this, this is a little bit old, but it's from 2013. It was by uh, our friend Dr. Hartle. And um, one thing they, they looked at is the availability of uh, navigation systems. And you could see just around the world, uh, from North America through Asia Pacific, the availability. You could see it wasn't that available. And I imagine now if you redid this survey, it would be a lot more available throughout the world. But in terms of the use, you could see here it was only used maybe you know 10 to 20 percent of the time or maybe a little bit only in selected cases so again this is 2013 and I guess if we redid this survey we maybe double these numbers but we're still not at the point where people are using navigation regularly which makes surgery more accurate and so you sort of wonder why that is and um, their conclusion was the um, the spine surgeons, they, they acknowledge the value of it, but the current systems do not meet their expectation in terms of the ease of use and the integration into the surgical workflow. And so to increase its use, it has to become more cost efficient, and there needs to be scientific data now to clarify its potential benefits. Now the data is out there, so for sure. But in terms of the learning curve, if you look at here, this is um, a study uh, looking at 270 consecutive patients. You see the first 30 cases, their, their accuracy was 86%. And then after that, it just kept you know, rising and rising. But in the, initially, the, it's worse than freehand in the beginning. So it's important to know that uh, when you start using navigation, you actually may be worse than your freehand uh, capabilities. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Meyer, who actually came and spoke here a few years ago about a, uh, a study looking at a learning curve in the thoracolumbar spine. And, and they use a very common grading scale looking at where uh, screws end up after uh, placement. And you can see, obviously, A and B is where you sort of want it. C and D is, is not, a, not a great placement. And one thing they did find, as you can see here on the sort of the graphs on the left, where it says quarter, one, two, three, four, and those, those are actually months. And you can see the accuracy increase. And their sort of take home message is that for the thor thoracic spine, it takes approximately four months to be considered sort of um, uh, established in terms of the, your capability with navigation. So that's also something to think about, how long it takes for you to be um, efficient with navigation. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about workflow. This is something that I've been interested in, in uh, a lot for many years, and I'll, I'll talk about why it's so important. So navigation, is it's, it's complex. It's a multi-system, multi-team technology. You have to have a surgeon, the scrub tech, radiology tech, image guidance tech, instrumentation representative. So normally, in, in a fluoro case, all you need is surgery, Surgeon, radiology tech, and a scrub tech. With navigation, you need all these people. You need everybody there sort of coordinated. Even the anesthesiologist has a role with navigation. And then you need the scrub tech, even implant rep, and the circulator. And so the important part of navigation is that it's really teamwork. It's kind of, we think of it as like a pit stop model, OK? It's a high maintenance technology. You need to think about, just like Dr. Kim said, the OR room layout, all the factors that come into play, the timing of various supports 
staff. One of the most frustrating things is waiting on people when you're, 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 you're waiting for an instrument from the scrub tech, you're waiting on imaging from the radiology tech. So really you want a dedicated neuro navigation team that is there and they are, everyone's up to date about what they're supposed to be doing. And that is important because problems will arise and you gotta be able to troubleshoot as a team. And so an uh, important concept is this concept of flow. And um, I don't know if, if, if anyone ever feels an idea of flow in the operating room, but uh, I do. And um, when, it, when, it, when you're in it, it feels great. And when you're not, it's disrupted. And so uh, we just did a, a case yesterday morning, a laminoplasty, my partner and I, each one of us had a different mode. We were each doing our roles. And at the end of it, we were done in you know, 45 minutes, an hour, and there was no problems. And that's what you want. You want no disruptions. And so what does that look like in everyday life? So this is an example, um, the pit stop model, rowing. That was me back in 93 when we won the New England championships. And so I remember when we were rowing, it was, it was so important. Everybody had to hit the oar in the water at the same time. If you didn't, you were disrupted completely. And so that is a perfect example. And the same thing is with the, within surgery. Flow disruptions are deviations from that natural progression of a procedure that potentially compromise the safety uh, and efficiency. And so what happens? Then there's errors, uh, team gets upset, and then potentially there's worse outcomes. I'm going to go through some of the taxonomy for disruptions in workflow because it's important to identify what the issues are. So there's communication issues. So for example, the scrub nurse does not give the tool requested by the surgeon. There's coordination issue. Uh, the surgeon drops a tool and the scrub nurse hesitates before giving a tool. Equipment issues, the surgeon needs a tool and it hasn't been sterilized yet. Or you know, you wanted the one kerosene and they only got you the two kerosene. Uh, interruptions, the resident asks for details about a part of the surgical procedure and it stops the case. I mean, it's important for teaching, but also you have to think of this as how it affects the flow of the case. And what does that mean? Well, so I talk about this, it's, I call it a snowball effect. It starts in an initial state of a small and significant and it builds upon itself and becomes larger and larger. So those cumulative flow disruptions lead to a snowball effect of increasing lost time and possibly larger mistakes. And so I was curious about looking into this. And so um, at the time when I was at Cedars, there was a human factor specialist named Ken Catchpole, and we were doing um, some work together. And I said, you know, it'd be really great to understand why is it that at Cedars Sinai, when I was there, we had one OR and we had you know nine rooms, and everything worked so well in some rooms, and some rooms it didn't. And so human factors analysis or ergonomics is this scientific discipline of studying all aspects of the way humans relate to the world around them. And so the idea is why humans do what they do and how can they get better at doing it, okay? And so we looked at this uh, using a human factor study to do a direct observation of 40 navigated cases. We had 31 expert surgeons, nine novice uh, cases. We had an observer in the room detailing notes of all flow disruptions, timings, aspects of, of people coming in and out. And then we divided the cases into a pre-O-arm, O-arm spin, uh, the instrumentation, and we recorded all this, and we had about 100 hours of observation. And what did we find? We found about 530 flow disruptions, 14, about 14 per case. If we had one spin, it was this many, two spins, 21, three or more, it's 26. And then we tried to break it down to when did these flow disruptions happen and what caused them? So a big part of it was um, the screws. So when you're, you're actually getting the equipment, right? So the scrub tech hands you the um, navigated instrument and the sphere's dirty, has some blood on it. So you have to wipe it. So them understanding that everything needs to be handed in the right way caused there no, no disruption. And so what we found was a big part of it was coordination and equipment. And then you could see some of the other uh, issues, training, so that's a, a part of it. But you know, you, you'll allow disruptions with training because that's part of surgery, but the other parts kind of makes it more complicated. 
Also, what are the other unique flow disruptions that happens for each part of the, of the surgery? So the case start, there's coordination issues like the anesthesiologist is not in the room or during the positioning, the, um, the image, um, the image uh, guidance representative uh, unplugs the bovie to get his O-arm in and then doesn't forget to put it back in. And so that's a disruption when you're ready to use the bovie. Uh, when you're putting in the screws, there's some equipment issues. And you could see that all these issues sort of come up. And um, the important part is how to account for that. And so what we found was it came down to the experience in the room. So when you had an expert surgeon in the room, everything went better. And I always sort of give the example of Dr. Johnson, because when he's in the room, he's, he's, he's a cowboy, right? He's, he's, he's pushing everybody along. He's telling him, you go here, you go there. I want you to get me that. And he runs the room like he's running his, his farm, his, his rodeo. Um, but the novice, he's kind of like looking to the image guidance tech. He's looking to the radiologist. He's like, OK, what's the next step? What do I need to do now? He doesn't have that experience, so things are disrupted. Um, we found that the IGS tech who was expert made a big difference, a significant difference, and the surgeon. Um, interestingly, scrub tech didn't make a difference in our study, but I'm going to show you another study where it does. In terms of actually what does this all mean, what does this all translate to, is that it's important that when the surgeon and navigation tech expertise actually reduces the flow disruption. So an expert surgeon reduces it by about six flow disruptions an hour, and an expert uh, tech reduces it by six and a half flow disruptions an hour. And what does this mean? It translates into 14 to 45 minutes of delay. And I'll tell you, when you're, in, when you're in surgery, I mean, I used to work with Dr. Chapman. He doesn't like to be delayed. No one likes to be delayed in surgery. It makes everybody frustrated. It raises everyone's uh, level of um, consciousness in a different way. So um, our navigation workflow take home points. A pit stop model will be the way to increase efficiency. Um, uh, trying to understand the learning curve in terms of getting everybody up to speed and then really having a dedicated team in the cardiac. Think about heart surgeries, right? They always have a dedicated team. Why is it in spine surgery there isn't a dedicated team? Now, in our hospital, we usually have pretty much the same people in our room. And the same thing as should be in every hospital, that you want to have your A team with you. So the goal really is to integrate all these elements to reduce flow disruption. So you have the people in the room know what they're doing. You have the process everyone's on, on board with, communicating clearly with everybody. And the environment is set up. And then the technology is working right. And then that leads to a nice flow. There was one other study that looked in a similar way how, as, as we did uh, that looked at crew familiarity and surgical workflow disruptions. And it was pretty interesting. They, they looked, in, like, like we did, looked at elective neurosurgical procedures. Um, and they found it was about 10% of the time they had workflow disruptions. Um, what they also found was that um, there were distractions and colleagues interrupting the, the, scrub, the scrub nurses that was causing a lot of disruptions, and then teaching moments, and again, colleagues interrupting uh, were the most frequent workflow disruptions for surgeons. So what does that mean? Do you like tell colleagues not to come in the room? Of course not. But these are just parts of, 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 how, of what we have to do with, uh, deal with as surgeons. Um, what, was, what was important that they talked about was that when the surgeon and the scrub nurse were familiar with each other, it made everything better. And you could think about it. I know the surgeons in the room could think about it. When you know, you know this scrub nurse is in the room, you just feel better. You feel more confident. You work better. When it's this other person in the room, you're like, mm, OK, I'll get it done. But I'm not going to feel as strong. And so that's part of it. As surgeons and as everybody in the room, we need to think about these things. So here's a little bit about my lessons learned over the time of, uh, for failures of navigation. So an important lesson, number one, is have a standardized setup and team. Dr. Kim talked about this. You know, every, with everything needs to be exactly where you want it. You need to be in charge of the room. This is where the camera goes. This is where the, the, the image guidance goes. This is where the instrument table goes. And when everything is in the, the room is laid out right, everything is in flow. You know, you can see here, there's the arm, there's the camera. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. So standardizing the setup, um, making sure there is no line of sight issues, making sure that everybody understands the instruments we're supposed to be using, and that the nurse, the x-ray tech, everybody is on board with the plan. Lesson two, you got to check the registration. This is a great image. Uh, you could see here in the middle here, 
Um, this is the uh, tracker, and it's directly midline, and you can see here, it's directly midline on the, on, on the scan. And that's what you want to see. You just, have to, you just have to do an accuracy check. Lesson three, got to respect the reference arc and think about it. Dr. Kim is, is notoriously you know, religious about the reference arc. You can't have any motion of the reference arc. You can't have any bun bun bumping into it. He talks about the, when the fellows, he used to tell, you have to stay away from this. You got to make sure the reference arc is not dirty, that it's not, you know, there's no blood on it. And, um, you know, part of that is that dedicated team. Everybody using it every day makes it much, much go much easier. But also, part of this, this was a, a paper by Knottmeyer's group, is that you have to think about where you're going to be instrumenting because where you're going to be going, you don't want to bump into the reference arc. So that's why Dr. Kim was saying you have to have it out of your way. So this is an important thing to think about. How am I going to place that reference arc out of my way to make sure there's no interference with the instrument reference arc? And so how do we do it? Dr. Kim talked about this, so did Dr. Johnson. Reference arc in the iliac crest for the spinous process. We all go back and forth. Sometimes we do one, but sometimes we do the other. For the cervical thoracic spine, we usually use the spinous process. In the upper, upper cervical, Mayfield head holder is the best. Lesson four, you got to make sure the imaging is accurate. The image quality needs to be perfect. You have to double check. You can't just say, okay, take the spin, looks fine. You have to make sure it looks good. The image quality is not good, you got to re-spin. And then lesson number five, the spine can move. This is mostly relevant to the cervical spine. This was a study looking at uh, range of motion with respect to uh, the level registration when you're um, one level away versus the same level of that you're working at. So some people believe when you're doing cervical spine navigation that you should move the reference arc or move the spinous process clamp to each level. So you do one level, then you move it again, take a new spin. There are some people who believe that um, because the cervical spine is so mobile. Here is a study looking at from C3 to C5, it was the highest level of grade two and grade three breaches. So that area of the spine is highly susceptible to movement. So um, that's why Dr. Johnson said something I came up with, taping down the patient, trying to make it as rigid as problem, because there's more problematic in the cervical spine. Here's another study looking at this number of spinal segments away from the tracker in the cervical spine, how, what the risk of the perforation is. And you could see there, you're two or three levels away in the cervical spine, you could be up to 40% of a perforation rate. So this is just not acceptable. Lesson six, if in doubt, re-image. So we talked about this re-spin. If something doesn't look right, it's not not that the patient's anatomy is wrong, it's that the image isn't right. Lesson seven, avoid skiving. This is a tough one. Um, and I would say um, in anybody's hands, skiving is a hard, a hard thing. And um, it, I found this article um, by Crawford, Norbert Johnson, and Theodore, and some of the surgeons in the room will know those names because these are the, this is the team that developed the Globus robot, the Excelsius. And so what they developed is a, an, a basically a meter that will show you if you're skiving. So this is an important um, advantage uh, of using a robot. And so, but the point is that if you're not using a robot and you have this skive meter, then what? It, what does it come down to? And you have to have a high degree of procedural awareness. You have to have a anatomical knowledge. You need to have surgical experience. You need to know when the technology is not working for you. And you need to be able to um, troubleshoot that. Uh, lesson eight, I'd say, is start with simple cases. You know, um, not just bring it in for the complex ones. And this is the, you know, this is why. Um, People adopt things, you know, so uh, they don't adopt things when it's a high complex operation with high costs. They do it when it's low complexity and low cost. That's when you want to sort of adapt new technology. So you start simple and do it often, is what I say. Uh, some of the take home messages learning curve is real. Uh, consider the workflow, have a dedicated team who are familiar with each other, who want to work with each other. Uh, some of the lessons that everything can go wrong in, in navigation and uh, having a standardized setup is important. Use it routinely, check the registration, the reference arc, recognize the mobility of the spine. If in doubt, get an image and uh, start with simple cases. I want to thank um, my two mentors, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Kim. We keep doing these courses around the world because of their mentorship and I couldn't be happier that all the time I spent with them. Keep it going. Thanks. Any questions?
Great, great talk, Danielle. You know what? I, I truly believe that you're pushing the frontier back on this, this whole concept about uh, operating room efficiency, and that's what it is. It's human factors. Um, and that, that was one of the biggest criticisms for many, many years, still is, still is, and, and it's appropriately so because we add more technology and uh, there are certain things we show all this great technology and data that we're getting better at all these things, but they have their costs and it's not just financial costs, it's, it's time. Okay, and time is, time is one thing that we have a hard time controlling. Okay, we can't control time in reality, but on the other hand, how much time we spend in the operating room with some of these things is, is controllable and maximizing the efficiency. You, you know, you just look around in your operating room and you think about all the time that's lost or wasted and you just stand there and look. And that's where we come up with this. And we just say, this is where we got to make some inroads. Just about everything. It's kind of like, you go back to even things like turnover time in your operating room, which is, which is a nemesis to all surgeons, I'm sure, in, in this room and that are uh, uh, viewing this, this uh, program uh, and symposium from afar. We all agree on that. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to our, our next, uh, next talk, which uh, Dr. Terrence Kim is going to talk to us again about navigating the cervical spine step by step. Are we ready to go from the lab? Maybe, maybe five minutes. Hey, five minutes. What do we need to do for five minutes? Take a little break. Take a little break. Is that good? Let's take a break, and it's a good time for a coffee break or whatever.